Good afternoon, church. Happy Sabbath. All right. Um, we just have the full week as we move home. Nervousness, shyness, so that your people can understand the lesson even more what we started throughout the week. Forgive us. What does that mean to you guys? What do you think of the roots of Abraham in that sense? I would think his uh, origin, like where he came from, uh, Chaldea, Ur of the Chaldees. That's what I think. Yeah, uh, I like that. And also, what I thought of it was how Abraham was totally grounded or totally the foundation, the firm foundation, Abraham to leave everything behind to just go. Abraham will find himself in a suspended void without his past, which he has lost, and without his future, which he does not see yet. And this will take us to Sunday lessons entitled, Abraham's Departure. Can somebody please read for us Genesis 12, verses one to nine? Go ahead. A comment on uh, the last thing you mentioned, like the uprooting of Abraham from his uh, roots, like from like, you know, Chaldea, or like, you know, um, where he had all his family, he had everything that he knew, and God called him to leave. And you, you just mentioned that he was gonna leave his past. He was gonna like, you know, basically lost his stone, our sinful lives, or like, you know, whatever we used to be doing, we have to leave it behind. And then, but this is where we felt like we were safe. And God is calling us, we have no idea where God is gonna lead us. So we, we become fearful, we say, you know what? Let me just do a halfway, halfway, let me give half of my life to God, but still retain some kind of control because who knows where God is going to lead me. And that implies a lack of trust in God. And this is why the Bible calls us like lukewarm, the majority of Christians, because we are undecided to go fully with God or, or to abandon the sin. I think this is very, very deep. And also when God also called unto Abraham to leave, he also tell him not to be afraid because I'm sure he was afraid because it did not know where he was going. It did not know what was going to happen. But God also said here in um, Genesis 15 verse one, he told him, do not be afraid. And I think as Christian, if we are called to do something, we should also not be afraid. Yeah, what I wanted to add to that is because that sometime we we for example eating stuff we don't know how they made them however we trust those people well, however god is way more than that he know what is good for us the only thing that we have to do we, we have to trust him and that trust is when he um very specific to to us let's say he want us to do something we have to just put everything behind and make sure we follow whatever he said to us because he's the father, he's the foundation, he's the root of everything. And I'm pretty much sure he's the one control everything. He know what's good for you, what's bad for you. I don't think the same way we have like mom and dad, they will never see their kids suffering from you know something they know that's bad for them. They will always make sure they protect them and give the best. But I'm pretty much sure God can give you the best of the best, and that's why we have to trust him. I agree, and it's also the same when Abraham, when God called unto Abraham, he asked him to leave his family. He didn't go with his dad or a mother. He, all he had to do was trust in God. So when we read, I'm not sure who will read that for us. Okay, Rick, go ahead. We'll see more. Um, Genesis 12, verses 1 through 9. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abraham took, his Sar took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, 
And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto a place of Shisham, unto the plain of Morah. And the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from hence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent. And Abram journeyed going on still towards the south. What do you think of what you just read? This is so, although God called unto Abraham, he made a promises to him. And I feel like Abraham, he had the choice not to go because God does not force you to do things. He called out to you to do things and you still have, um, what's the word? You can still make the choice to go or not to go. So based on what my brother just read, what do you guys think of it? So one of the things that I, I like about this, this uh, uh, verse is because that Abraham did not only go himself, but he took his family. So sometimes I'm wondering, when you're a servant of God, you're the leader. When God talked to you, you should know how to translate the message to your family. And you know, sometime when God is talking to you, he's just giving you the message and you need to know how to spread the message. And that message, if you trust God, anybody who you will share that message, they will receive it. Uh, and, and, and it's very powerful. Sometimes you see like in church, we have seen a lot of leaders They've been doing everything, you know, leading a lot of position in church. However, their wife and kids, they do not follow the word of God. I think that means uh, before you even go or lead something, you need to make sure you have a very good relationship with God. Because when you're the messenger, um, whatever you receive from God, if you pray and make sure you follow the God direction, it will be easier for people who want you to follow you. Add on that, because you, uh, can you imagine, like, you know, Abraham was talking about God telling him to leave, but I, I bet you at the same time he was making preparation that he was leaving. So the people yeah. could see, like, look, he was serious. He wasn't just talking the talk, but not walking the walk. And what you're saying, this is what happened a lot, like, where you have, like, the us as Christians, we talk the talk, but people in our home, they see we're living a completely different life. Yeah. And that's why they don't follow. Because they're like, you know, uh, my, my dad is a fraud. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so there is no power in that. And that's, I think that's what, like, even if you go back to Noah, you saw the same thing. Noah was preaching about a flood coming, but he was also building an ark. Yeah. So he was living the message. Right. Um, also, one thing I wanted to mention from the story, when God called unto Abram to go, he was not only living his family or everything he had, he was also living himself. Because for God to accomplish the promise that he made from the beginning where he said, now the Lord said unto Abraham, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show, you, um, show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great. So for that to happen, Abraham had to leave the past, live himself to become what God wanted him to become. And I think sometimes as men or women of God, sometimes God is calling out unto us to leave in order for him to uproot us to make us the woman of God, the men of God that we have to be, we have to leave certain things. That the is that true? I don't think God will want me to leave that, but we certainly know what God is asking of us to leave. Uh, yeah. Sometimes we just feel like we just attached to something that we shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you, for example, um, have the passion for something, and it's been on you for, for a very long time, and at some point, you have to do the transition. That's why it's so complicated. I remember myself coming to US for the first time, and you know, 
have seen like uh, my because I've been living with my mom since I was born, and like uh, the cousin, family, and friends, and all of those people were gonna leave behind coming to a country. I I I know I have family, but I don't really close to them. And like now, when you come here, you have to start over, making new friends, new people, and leave everything behind. Until you know, it's not a bad thing. And sometimes when God is challenging you to do something, it's because he sees on you the best that you never experienced before, and he wants you to go there. Amen. Um, right now we're moving up to Monday's lesson, which was titled, The Temptation of Egypt. Um, can somebody please read Genesis 12, verses? And Abraham went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass, when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto his Sarai, his wife, Behold now, I know that that art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. And it came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman, that she was very fair. The princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commanded her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And he entreated Abram well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen, and he asses and men servants and maid servants, and she asses and camels. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh in his house with a great plagues because of Sarai, Abraham's wife. Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why sayest thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to, my, to me to wife. Now therefore behold thy wife. Take her and go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. Wow. When I read that story, I was like, okay, I'm so confused. What came to Abram's mind to just get up without God's permission this time? Because first off, God was the one who called unto him to leave where he was, to go to a new place. And now, based on just his judgment on what he thinks was right to do, and he got up and left and... What do you guys think of that? So uh, I'm thinking is where that's where you have to be patient. So where the, when God is calling you, even though you try your best to follow whatever God said, at some point you have to be very patient. Just because he said to move, for example, from here to another place, that doesn't mean once you go there you can do whatever you want. So you have to keep praying Every decision you're going to make has to reflect from what God wants you to do. And sometimes we just, be just because God says, okay, move from, from Florida to another state and you get there, that doesn't mean he's done with you. Once you get there, it's because you're going to do his work. And what you have to do if you have to let him, you know, do whatever he wants you to do. That's a very interesting point you brought up because a lot of us Christians, we believe that. Like, we believe that, okay, God, I'm going to walk with God until I become an adult. Like, if spiritually, that I can, now I can do my own thing. There is no such thing. Like, to <laughs> walk with God is actually an eternal thing. Even the angels who are in heaven right now, if one of them decided, oh, you know what, I'm wise enough. I'm going to go do my own thing. You will have a Lucifer point too. And you've seen that story. This thing happened multiple times in the Bible, especially in the story of uh, Joshua. After he defeated Jericho, right, God had tell him to go and do uh, the circle of Jericho, whatever. They won the victory, right? Then the next battle, it was a smaller city, Ai. Joshua was like, eh, that's a small city. Let's get like 3,000 men and send them over there and conquer the city. They were defeated because he thought at that time, like, you know, I don't need to ask God for this. You know, it's too small for God. We got this. And that's the same thing Abraham just did here. You know, there is a famine in the land. You know, I got to save my... Uh, we can see that him doing that, he he was only thinking of, him, of himself because he asked Sarah, his wife, to lie. 
and say, oh, tell them you're my sister and not my wife. I mean, all those, we know Sari is his half-sister, but still, at the time, Sari was being the wife. So he made Sarai lie and only think of himself. So there's a question here I really like. Why is disobedience never a good choice? Because because of what Abraham did, we saw that there were consequences. Well, when 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 some when for example God is leading you, um, you know whatever you're gonna gonna do, have to reflect on God. And when your wood is from God, you know for sure and the consequences might be on your favor. But when you just doing things on your own and you know we can't predict the future, that's the one of the things that as human beings you don't have the power to think of. The only per the only the only person that can see the future is God. And the only way you might have an idea about the future when you letting God, you know, use you the way He wants to. And you see what happened? If he spoke to God prior he made the decision, God can say that's not the best one. And you know, do something else. However, he was trying to do it on his own, that's why the consequences is bad. And I'm pretty much sure when God is, you know, leading you and you let you let God use you, I'm pretty much sure you will see a lot of success on your word. But if you go on your own way, there's a high possibility for you to fail and fail big. Yeah, because every step of your journey, especially if God was the one who called you, you need to listen and seek God for guidance because he was the one who called you in the first place. So he knows what to do in any situation. And God's calling really <laughs> doesn't come without risk. It doesn't come without... Um, What's the word? It doesn't come without no consequences. You're still going to face tribulations along the way. Now we go to Tuesday lessons, Abraham and Lot. It's a lot of reading, guys, so who will read for us? I'll read this time. Genesis 13, verse 1 through 18. All right, it reads. So Abraham went up to Egypt to the Negev, and he and his wife, he and his wife, and all that belonged to him, and Lot with him. Now Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. He went on his journeys from the Negev as far as Bito, to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bito and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there formerly, and there Abram called on the name of the land of the Lord. Now Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herbs and tents, and the land could not sustain them while dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. Now the Canaanite and the Perizzite were dwelling then in the land. So Abraham said to Lot, Please, let there be no strife between you and me, now between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. It is, he is not the whole land before you. Please, separate from me. If to the left, then I will go to the right, or if to the right, then I will go to the left. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the, of the Jordan and that it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go to Zoar. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan and led Jornad eastward. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan while Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tents as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, exceedingly and sinners against the Lord. The Lord said unto Abram, After the Lord, after Lot had separated from him, now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, 
northward and southward and eastward and westward for all the land which you see I will give it to you to enter your descendants forever I will make your descendant as the dust of the earth so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth then your descendants can also be numbered arise walk around the land through its land and breed for I will give it to you then Abraham moved his tents and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and there he built an altar between Abraham and God. But here, after he separated with Lot, God spoke to Abraham again. So I'm wondering if the presence of Lot could cause something like that. What do you guys think? I don't think like Lot was like a, a problem really. And I think like, you know, the separation from Lot could have caused Abraham to feel some type of way. Cause you know, like he loved his uh, nephew, that was his nephew. So I guess like, you know, to me, it seems like God just came back to reassure him of the promises, especially like, you know, he went through a lot of times. He went through a hard time in Egypt, you know, where he could have almost lost his wife. And now he lost Lot because of the separation and the strife. So I, I do think this is just like reassurance that I'm still with you. The promise is still valid and I'm gonna give you what I promise you to do. Because, you know, like, as human beings, at times, when we have a promise from God and a lot of time pass, we can become discouraged, especially if, like, a lot of trials and tribulation comes. So God, every here and there, like, you know, would, like, you know, encourage us back again. That's why we know, no matter what we're going through, we should go back to the Word of God to get encouragement, to allow us to keep going, knowing that God is still with me no matter what. And, and sometimes, uh, I've seen that a lot of, you know, maybe in our community, when we depend on somebody, sometimes we do not really think about the consequences. Because, for example, in, your, in our family, you might see we depend on, like, on our father's or mom or brother or sister. However, when God is working with you, he just wants you to focus on him, not on people who are on you. And most of the time we fail is because we have somebody trying to guide us somewhere in, in that, that place we're going through or that place we're thinking might be the right direction is where we're going to fail. And the separation between Lot and Abraham is just one way for God to reassure him that he's still here. He's still, our, he's still, he's still like the same person that, you know, tell him to go to Egypt and do all of the work that he has to. And that way... Abraham can just not thinking about people who are on him, but at least focus more on God. And also what I noticed in uh, in that story, as you see, there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham and Lot. So we know that Abraham loved Lot. That's why he took he took light with him. So now there's starting to be problems in the camp where both of them dwell. That could actually cause a strife between Abraham and and um, Lot because that's their um, their herdsmen. So in a way, it he he put it that way so Lot can actually go his own way and take care of his own home instead of depending on him in that camp where they were because I as you can see they were all having more properties and more um, herds more um, cattle and everybody's growing so it, you have to go your own way and raise your own family also that's what I was I noticed in that story right and also we see how lot he took everything that looked um, already prepared in a sense everything that looks so nice and everything that was left was like s Abra I'm sure Abraham was like oh God what am I going to do with what I have left but I think God also came to Abraham and say although what you're seeing is probably not the same as what you saw Lot took but what you looking at what you're seeing I will make you the promise that he had made I will still fulfill my um promise to you moving on to Wednesday lesson I see that time is running out 
the Babel Coalition. Can somebody please read for us Genesis 14, verses 1 through 17? Uh, I got a comment. You know, Go ahead. the thing we're saying about Lot, I know when it comes to uh, like last days, especially like the message, Adventist message of country living, that's one of the uh, key part of it. Because you see like the Bible emphasized, it says Sodom, the inhabitants of Sodom were wicked exceedingly, right? And God was not de designing for Abraham to go live in those cities because all the cities were corrupt. But Lot, look at the city, he saw something completely different. He saw the prosperity that he could get from, from being in those cities, right? And I think it's the same way with us too, though. That's like, a, like we hear that message, but a lot of times we look at the cities, we're like, man, in the cities I can have a career, I can have this and that. And we ignore the gay parades, we ignore the constant partying, we ignore like the murder rates, we ignore all these things, but we're looking at the prosperities. And if you look at the story later on, Lot lost everything he had. <laughs> you know, like the corruption of the city destroyed his entire family. So again, that shows us something that, especially when it comes to country living, and we know that like, okay, when it comes to country living, like just like we've been reading, we don't just get up and say, let me go to the country because we hear a message. We must have a relationship with God and for God to tell us when to move and where to move. Because we saw when Abraham moved without God telling him to do something, he got himself in trouble. So it's something that we should consider as we live in, especially in these last days, knowing that the judgments of God are going to be hitting those cities because of their wickedness. And not just, when we move into a place, our first priority should not be how much money and how well prepared this place is, but whether this place is where God wants me to be at the moment. Because like you were saying, Abraham went to the plain of Mamre, and he was still living in tents while Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom, but later on we find out that like, Lot has big houses in Sodom. So something to think about. Yeah, I remember um, watching videos about the lesson um, somebody mentioned. For us right now, we live in a world full of evil. And without even realizing, evil is in, 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 we either in the middle, we are in the middle of it. And if we don't seek God daily, we're going to find ourselves the same, same thing that happened to Lot. So I think that's really something to consider. Who's reading for us? Genesis 14, verses 1 through 17. I think that's the last thing we're going to read today. Yeah, I read it. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elisar, and Sherdolomer, king of Elam, and Teodol, king of nations, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemibur, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. All these were joined together in the valley of Sidim, which is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Sherdolomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. And in the fourteenth year came Sherdolomer and the kings that were with him, and smote the Raphaims and Ashtaroth, Karnaim, and Zuzim, and Ham, and the Inims, and Shave Kirathaim, and the Horites, and their Mount Seir, unto Elpharon, which is by the wilderness. And they returned and came to Enmishpat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites that dwell in Hazazon Tamar. And they went out, the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, the same as Zoar, and they joined battle with them in the valley of Sidim, with Shedolomer, the king of Elam, and with Tidul, king of nations, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elisar, four kings with five. And the valley of Sidim was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there, and they that remained fled to the mountain. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, and all their victuals, and went their way. And they took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods, and departed. And they came one that had escaped, and told Abraham the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eschol, and brother of Anar. And these were confederate with Abraham. And when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursue them unto Dan. Thank you. Um, one thing I realized here is how the Abraham that left and went to Egypt is not the same Abraham there. Because I feel like if it was the same, Abraham would probably say, 
Oh, really? Okay, I'll pray for him. I, I, will, I will ask God to, to do something. Because in the beginning, it's Eli to save his life. So here we see how Abraham, he's showing God's character, God's love. He went to God and decided to take with him 318 men, not even a lot, to go and fight and get a lot. So I think um, as Christian, even though we, we went through things or people do things to us, we don't have to return the same thing, the same, the same action or the same way they treated us. We don't have to do the same. What do you guys think of that part? One thing I realized, too, is like Abraham was brave, too. Because a lot of times I think um, I listened to the Patriarch and Prophet, the chapter that speak about that. So a lot of times people, people uh, equate righteousness or holiness with cowardice. And Ellen White was saying that's not true. Because actually righteousness means boldness. See, somebody here, it wasn't Abraham was just going to war for the sake of war. He was going to rescue his nephew. And he was brave. He took the risk. You know, because that was a righteous act. Like you were saying, this was not the same thing as Egypt. Egypt, he was trying to save himself. And that was the sin in the matter. But here, he's trying to save his nephew. And that's a whole completely different thing. So he just showing you the character of God. Like he was willing to put his life at risk to save somebody else. And in the beginning, he was willing to put somebody else's life at risk to save himself. <laughs> yeah. um, when I think of that, I think we should pray every day for us to have, to, to build and be like, develop God's character as we live in the last day. So Thursday lesson, which is entitled, The Tithe of Melchizedek. I know when it comes to tithe, everybody has uh, some sort of opinion. Oh, do I have to give back? I don't make that much, although that, I think that's the first time it mentioned where um, it talks about tithe, how you have to give tithe in return to show your gratitude. And here in the story, we see how this is how Abraham gave back to show his gratitude to God for what God has done for him. I don't recall seeing that God asked him to do that part. I'm not sure if any of you read that. I don't recall reading that. But we can see as Christian, we may go through things, but at the same time, when the Lord is blessing us, we have to show our gratitude when we give our time. Any comments, any suggestion on the last part of the lesson? With that one, that one is a very interesting thing. Um, last night we were studying this topic called situational ethics, right, and God. Situational ethics is basically like, you know, you look at a situation and you determine for you that we have to pay the tithe and offering. They have a lot of things in the Bible, like when you uh, read, especially with Abraham, it doesn't mention it per se, but just what you see, it tells you that the people know of that thing. So Abraham is trying to basically show you know, that Abraham knew of the tithing issue, right? So when uh, Melchizedek came before him, he gave him 10%. You never see when Melchizedek says, okay, give me 10%, but Abraham knew that's what he had to do, right? The tithing is something that God instituted to keep the work, his work going, right? The tithing was like in the past to maintain the sanctuary services, to take care of the Levites and so forth or whatever. Now we have a lot of people that are saying, look, the church is wasting the tithe money. The church is doing this and that with the money. I'm not gonna pay the tithe. I'm, I'm gonna use the tithe money to give to the poor. I'm gonna use the tithe money to help or whatever. But when you do that, you are doing what is right in your own eyes and disobeying a clear command of God. And that's what the issue is at. You know, it goes back to the same thing with like uh, Abraham and his wife. God says that lying is a sin. Now Abraham found himself in a situation where he said, you know what, I'm in a tight situation here. I need to do what's right in my own eyes. And what's right in my own eyes is lying to save myself, but he's still sin. So when it comes to tithing, you could, you could give, you could say, I'm, you can feed the poor. You could solve world hunger. But if you disobey what God says, you are sinning. It doesn't matter what the church is doing with the money. That's on the church. <laughs> that, that's, their, that's their issue with God. But you, as a believer in God, you do what God asks you to do. I want to add something. It's, it's where we have to pray for a church leader. And um, the, 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 the reason is sometimes we're just assuming things based on our opinion. However, if you pray for the people 
when they have the money, they will talk to God and God will give them direction. And we cannot just decide to give the money, you know, from maybe two people are in need. However, you can pray for all the leaders when they receive the money. They can make sure it's go to the right direction, and and if you if you look at the if you look at the the lesson, most of the time when we decided our own, we make you know we lead into a lot of you know failure, but when you let God talk to you, you mostly have um, seen the success on your way. For example, if you keep sharing the money you know to homeless people, you know maybe people around you that are in need. You might think it's a good thing. However, if you, let's say, the church decided to feed the people, the picture will be completely different. How? Let's say you have one day in Maranatha decided to go to downtown. And we say we're going to feed the homeless. When they talk about who came last week or months ago or last year, they say, they're going to say, Maranatha SDA Church, what gonna happen after? Those people, they see we sharing love, we, we care for each other, they will come to church. And that way, we're gonna be close to them. When you go on your own, they might just look for you, not the church. Now, when you're trying to talk to them about God, it might, it's gonna be very difficult. They might accept it, but it's gonna be very hard for you to confess them. If you see the church, they're going to see a bunch of people we living like brothers and sisters and we're sharing the gospel there in we are family. And also, you mentioned that we pray for our leaders. What, although we are praying, and I would say even if you don't see the result of what you prayed for, you should still give the time because... You don't know who's in charge. I know God is in charge, but you following, like my brother said, you following God's order. Although you're praying for them, but you don't know their heart as yet. You don't know if the change was made or if it has been made. So although you are praying, I would say to still give what the Lord asks of you to give. Because when we trust in God, it will bless us beyond measures. And it's the same with Abraham. Abraham believed, he trusted, and God blessed. Follow his commands, and trust me, it will bless us beyond measure. So this is the end of our lesson. I appreciate everybody who was here, who participated. And next Saturday, we will be studying Lesson 7, which starts this afternoon. And the title for it is The Covenant, the Covenant with Abraham. Before we leave, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for being with us this afternoon as we studied your lesson, as we share our opinions, what we think of it. We thank you that we thank you for being here with us. And as we are about that, you call us to be greater than what we were. So we ask that you please be with us, be with everyone who's about to come on stage and do something in your name. Forgive our sins. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Good afternoon and happy Sabbath, everyone. Today I'll be doing the health segment, and it is going to be about obesity. All right, so let us pray. Heavenly Father, we again thank you for an honor to come together, Lord, to worship you in this beautiful Sabbath day, Lord. Um, as long, even though it's hot, Lord, we ask that you continue to preserve us, uh, bless us, and guide me as we talk about the serious problems that's going on in this country. We ask you all these things. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. All right. How's everyone doing today? Amen. Amen. So today we're going to talk about obesity. Who knows what obesity is? All right. All right. So the definition I got was, it's a disorder involving excessive body fat 
that increases the risk of health problems. Obesity often results from taking in more calories than are burned by exercise and normal, normal daily activities. So basically, being overweight through excessive fat. So what are the things that it actually, you know, increases? Increase in cancer, you know, artery disease, type 2 diabetes, stroke, cap, um, cardiovascular disease, as well as significant increases in early mortality, which means early death, and economic costs. So it can actually hurt your pockets by going to the hospital for certain um, diseases. Now, two in five of adults in America experience these things when it comes to being overweight. Let's go to Proverbs 23, verse 20 and 21. Proverbs 23, verse 20 and 21. And it says, Be not among wine bibers, I think I'm saying it right, among riotous eaters of flesh. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. One of the things that really increase being overweight is gluttony. Who know what gluttony means? Over, overeating, who else? Overeating. So overeating is one of the things that increase overweight. All right. So let's go. So let's go to Proverbs thirty verse eight, another scripture, which says, "Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me." So it's only, if the food is convenient and is efficient for you. That's all you need. But people in mentality, they like to eat, you know, more than they can. And that's what caused obesity. All right? Now, there was one of the, I don't know if you guys know, there was one person that clearly said that he was a fat man in the Bible. <laughs> you guys know who it was? Yeah, he was a king. He was in Judges. He got stabbed. Yeah, let's go to Jude. Judges, I mean, 3 verse 17. Judges 3 verse 17. Do you guys believe being overweight is a problem? It's not to insult, but it actually do cause a lot of high blood pressure, and a lot of strokes, and a lot of diabetes. And this is very uh, a concern going on in America, even in the Haitian culture. Right. Yeah, Judges 3 verse 17. And then someone go to Daniel 1 verse 15. Someone read it. Anyone has a mic here? Okay. Judges 3 verse 17. You know, I thought the King James would have um, had another word for fat, but it didn't. <laughs> Judges 3 verse 17. <laughs> and then someone else will read down one verse um, 15. Go ahead, um, Rick. Um, Judges 3 17. And he brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab, in Eglon was a very fat man. All right. So this king was oppressing the people of Israel for about 18 years until one of the judges um, stabbed them and they were free. Um, Daniel 1 verse 15, somebody. Yes. verse again? I actually understood what you said. Uh. Maybe because I already know what the verse says. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> verse 15, right? Yes. And at the end of 10 days, the countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portions of the king's meat. What was the difference between Daniel and the king fat? There's nothing wrong with fat. We need fat in our system in order to survive. Now, excessive fat is what is the issue. 
a lot of downside when it comes to excessive fat. You want to be careful when it comes to that. Um, like I mentioned, it increases strokes. It, it, it's, people think it's sugar that's the main cause of diabetes too, but it's actually excessive fat. That's one of the main reasons of di um, type 2 diabetes. And other things. But we're, 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 we're talking about the statistics and all that stuff, so what is the solution to these things? Let's go to 3 John 1, verse 2. 3 John 1, verse 2. Not John, not 1 John, not 2 John, but 3 John 1, verse 2. Right, Dahana? Amen. Go ahead, um, Dahana. 3 John 1, verse 2. And it reads, For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth. Yeah. First John? Third John. I mean, third John, third John. one, verse two. Oh, beloved. Yeah. Okay, I was on three, sorry. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. So God wants us to prosper in health just like he wants our souls to prosper. God wants us to be healthy. Amen? Now, God has given us principle in the scripture and spirit prophecy how to become healthy, especially when it comes to obesity. You guys have heard of the health, law of health called New Start? The acronym New Start. Never heard of it? Rick, you heard of it. Oh, wow. Sam, you heard of it? New Start, the acronym. So N stands for nutrition. The diet is very important when it comes to our, um, our health, what we eat. We don't have time to talk about what we should not, what should not eat, but it's, we should eat by, to the glory of God. E, standing for, who can take a guess? Exercise. How many, how many of you guys exercise? One, two. Rick, I don't believe you for some reason. <laughs> But we should at least take 30 minutes to exercise each day, right? When you walk in, I mean, walking to, from the parking lot goes to the grocery store does not count. I'm talking about exercising, not with your back lump, but chest up, arm, make sure, the, make sure the air goes to your lung, make sure the blood is flowing. You don't want to sit all day in the office and then come home and then eat and then go to sleep. Not good at all. That can also increase fat. So that's new. So what's W? Water. Depending on your weight and your height, you should drink generally eight glass, seven to eight glasses of water a day. I'm guilty of that. Um, I drink too much juice. <laughs> All right. You don't wash. You don't want to wash your clothes with juice, right? You wash clothes with water. So in order to wash your inside your internal, you have to drink water. S, I'm a new start, huh? Sunlight. The sun needs to kiss you guys. You never stand, you never be in a church in the office, church all day, and then when you hit the sun, it feels kind of good. The pores open, right? You need sunlight to brighten your mood and to keep the blood flowing. What's the next one? T. Temperance, you have to control how much or when you eat. Eating, I'm guilty of it too. Eating late night and then sleeping is not good. <laughs> it is not good. The food needs time to digest before you go to sleep. What's the next one? A, air. Air, you need air to, I mean clean air, go outside nature, make sure the air breathes. That can actually help with um, increasing your, decreasing your weight. Um, R. Rest. You have to sleep at least, I believe, generally eight hours a night. We're, we're far, far, um, far guilty of that. And the next one, the most important thing, the T, trusting in God. God has to guide us through our journey, especially if we want to lose weight. I don't see a lot of 80-year-old that's overweight. To me, I don't see them. They don't exist. They die before time. I'm talking about someone that's big and 80, you don't see them, let alone 70. It's something to really consider. So if you have a family or loved one that's overweight, you may want to talk to them, yo, this is actually a disease that causes more disease. Tell them to trust in the Lord. 
and to trust in his diet that they may be able to glorify God through their body. Amen? Amen. Right, let us pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for an honor to come together, Lord, to talk about um, us being prosper regarding to our health, Lord. Um, we ask that you guide us, protect us, Lord, allow us to only trust in you and only in your words, Lord, that we may be able to do your will by the decision that we make when we go back home, Lord. Forgive us, cleanse us, we ask you all these things, and do this thing we do pray. Amen.
shall come rejoicing. Bring it in the sheep. Bring it in the sheep. Bring it in the sheep. We shall come rejoicing. Bring it in the sheep. Going forth with weeping, sowing for the master. Though the loss sustain our spirit. Number 190. 190, Jesus loves me. So let everyone stand, please. Bible. 
Praise you, the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with the string instruments and organs. Praise him upon the lounge cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Praise you the Lord. Sabbath. It's, I got the correction. Good afternoon. We're going to pray. I'm going to ask everyone to kneel. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to give you thanks for allowing us to be able to gather together. We're asking that as we have gathered, that your Holy Spirit will truly be present with us. Lord, there are some in here who have come with heavy burdens on their hearts, things that we cannot express, things that we cannot speak. But one of the things that we love is that when we enter your chamber, you're able to understand the true sentiments of our hearts. So Lord, whoever has come with that burden, we're asking that you would release that. And we're asking that you would give them the strength to go forward. Lord, we're asking also too, as we have gathered, that you would teach us. Lord, allow our minds to be receptive to what you have to speak to us. And Lord, as we are continuing to grow in you and learning of what sin truly is, we're asking that you would help us to let those things go. Lord, help us to truly become like who you would have us to be like. God, as we are going into our worship service and as we're about to as I'm about to speak Lord I'm asking that your words would speak through me Lord help it to truly be a light to those that are listening help it to be a bomb to someone in Gilead so God thank you so much for hearing and answering this prayer in Jesus precious name we do pray amen I was glad when they say, let us go into the house of the Lord. It is always a pleasure to be in the house of God. Uh, as I always say, after a tough week, the Lord has brought us here to worship him in spirit and in truth. We are to be glad. And especially the fact that it's the Sabbath day. You know that no boss is going to call you in to come to work. So we have to be thankful for the Lord. It's song hymn number 625.
Lord, plant my feet on higher afternoon church now we're about to take place um, a special part of the service which is prayer um, I know that many of us have a burden which we have carried throughout the week and today the Lord has granted us a day when we can reflect a day when we can rest a day when we can come to him and bring all of our burdens the Bible let us know in the book of Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 it says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, whereby we might obtain mercy and find grace in a time of need. Amen. I'm sure every single one of us is in need of something. Amen? Amen. And the Bible says that when we come to the throne of grace, we must come with confidence. The Bible also let us know, it says this, it says, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he heareth us, Whatsoever we ask, we know that we shall have the petitions that we desire of him. And I know that we have petitions that we want to bear before the Lord this morning. Amen. So will you join me this morning as we bow and seek our Father? Dear most gracious eternal Father, Lord, we come to you this morning, Lord. We don't come with a spirit that is haughty or one that just, just want to ask you and just for things over and over again, Lord. We know that you are not a genie, Lord. You are a personal God. And you relate to each and every single one of us as if there was not another soul on this earth. And so, Lord, we come to you individually at the sound of my hand. First and foremost, Lord, I ask that you will forgive me for my sins. Dear Father, I pray, Lord, that if there be iniquity, any iniquity in my heart, dear God, that you remove and that you will pardon me, dear God, so that this prayer may be heard. Dear Lord, we know that there is no secret in what you can do. And what you have done for others, dear God, you can do for us. And so, Lord, we have a burden this morning, Lord. We have been through a week of toil, a week of labor and study, dear God, and even... We have family members and members amongst us who are sick, dear Father, members who just need a word of encouragement, members who just need a visitation to the hospital or wherever they are, oh Lord. Father, I pray, dear Lord, at this very time, Lord, that you will comfort those individuals who are sick 
Lord, it is only by your power this morning that we were able to get up from our beds this morning, Lord. When we look at the lame, those who are incapable of walking or those who are incapable of getting out of their hospital beds, Lord, the mere fact that we were able to get up this morning, oh Lord, it is a signet of your grace and your mercy in our lives, dear Lord. And so this morning, this Sabbath day, Lord, we come and we ask you for pardon. We ask you for grace. And dear Lord, we ask that you will give us overcoming power to overcome the struggles that we face on a daily basis, oh Lord. We know, oh Lord, that you are a God of mercy, Lord. You are a, a, a God of salvation, oh Lord. And you see the struggles, the, de the daily temptations that we face on a daily basis, oh Lord. And your promise to us is that you will find a way for us to escape. And so, Lord, as we come this day, Lord, we're seeking for you, oh Lord, to open a way, to open a portal for us, oh Lord, so that we, so that our feet, which have been shackled by sin, by indulgences and whatsoever habit that we're, we are unwilling to let go of, dear Lord, we ask you, oh Lord, that you will break us free from that, dear Father. And Father, in a very special way, I would like to uplift the speaker of the hour. Dear Lord, you know this individual from the womb. Lord, I believe that you have a special message for us. And I pray, oh Lord, that as your speaker come this morning, oh Lord, that you will consecrate her heart, mind, and soul, oh Lord, so that we can hear from you. And dear Father, I pray that you will also continue to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Forgive us, O oh Lord, and save us in your kingdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, dear Lord, as we pray. I don't know for it. So I want to read the you know, scripture. We often, you know, often referring to Titan offering. And the good thing is today, from the lesson we have learned, when we do what God asks us to do, we see the blessing. And when we, when we refuse and we follow our own you know, desire, we have seen a lot of failures on the world. Let me read Malachi 3, verse 10. It says, Bring he all the tithe into the storehouse, that there might be meat in my house. And prove me now, here with the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the window of heaven, and pour you out of the blessing that there will shall not be room enough to receive it. And when you just give, you know, the tithe offering, we're just saving the blessing from God. You're just creating rooms for God to pour his blessing into you and your family. As we are about to collect the tithe offering, 
And we're going to sing with the uh, director of the day, 100. Time for a very short prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your amazing grace. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the privilege to be in your sanctuary, give you praise and you all deserve. As we present to you the title offering, may you please uh, bless everyone who give us that. May you please bless the rest of the service and we pray you in the name of your son, Holy Jesus. Amen. Good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon. Much better. Happy Sabbath. So this morning, we are going to go into our sermon for the morning. Now, I have to let everyone here know, when Rick asked me to speak specifically on this topic, I rolled my eyes. I did. I have to admit and I roll my eyes because with God, it's often when we are struggling with something or we need to overcome something, he'll give you a task to do in regards to that. So I had to accept my calling. Now, this morning, we're going to have a heart to heart. It's going to be from God's heart to our hardened hearts. And as we have that heart to heart, um, we are going to talk a little bit about forgiveness um, grace and mercy, and we're going to be really practical. So just we're just going to briefly bow our heads for prayer, and then we're going to go from there. So let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to give you thanks and praise for allowing us to make it up until this time in the sermon. Lord, we're asking that as we speak about these things, that you will truly convict our hearts. And Lord, I'm asking that you would give us the power to make the decision to change. God, thank you so much for all that you have done. In Jesus' precious name we do pray. Amen. Now, sometimes I hear people say, you should forgive, right? It's something simple. You should forgive. Look at everything you've done wrong, which is true. But what about those who've done nothing wrong but exist? What about someone who has been abused? They did nothing wrong. Or what about the abused or the, ne the neglected child? What about a person treated unfairly simply because he or she was born black? What happens when your husband is shot to death for no apparent reason? Should that person also too be counseled to forgive? If so, how does it take place? I'm gonna share an experience that I had growing up. I remember on May the 22nd, I believe I was 18 at the time, my grandfather was actually killed. And what took place is that he was outside, he was mowing the lawn, and someone came down the street, 
hit him um, off, hit him while he was mowing the lawn. He died in the middle of the pavement, in the middle of the street, and the person who actually was inside of the car died as well from the impact of the car. He got out the car and he fled the scene. Now, I will never, ever, ever forget this event that took place. It was actually the first time that I've ever heard my father cry, which was kind of um, interesting because up until this point, I've never known my dad to cry or anything. So the fact that he actually called me and he was crying, I was like, oh my goodness, what's going on? And then he expressed what took place. And one of the things about this, this situation that took place that I will never forget is the response of my father. And my sermon is not about this, but I just want to encourage the men, whether single or not single, you guys are important. The way that you respond to things as a husband, you are important. The way that you treat your children is very important. A lot of times in our society, men are demasculated and almost thought to not necessarily be important, but you guys are very important. And I say that because with my father, I will never forget his response. Now we were talking and one of the things about cases like this is that the, the family actually gets an opportunity to testify on the behalf of what they think or how they feel about the situation. And I remember my father saying that he did not want the person who killed his father to, to sit inside of jail and rot for his entire life. He said, die as a result of him, of a, as a result of his negligence. However, he said that you're my daughter, you're young. This man, this young man is also too young. And if you were to do something like this, I would want them to forgive you. So I never ever forgot that. It's the first time. It's the first time that I saw forgiveness in action. I learned very early on, forgiveness is not a concept that is innate. It takes a power outside of yourself. Jesus was talking to someone one day, and the conversation went like this. How often shall I forgive my brother? Seven times? Mm -mm. Jesus says 70 times seven. It is often the case that we put numbers and levels on how long we are going to endure hardships or someone's behavior. We look at the clock and say seven times and then I'm done. The concept of long suffering is demanding and offending to the human heart. Which brings me to my first point. We need to understand our fallen nature. We don't excuse the human nature. We understand it and then we bring it under subjection. In Jeremiah 17 verse nine, it states, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? And, and in Isaiah one verse six, it says, from the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and petrifying sores, they have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. We have a nature that needs to be brought under the subjection of God. When we discuss anything, whether it be lying, stealing, and even the issue of forgiveness, one of the things that needs to take place is that we have to give that to God. Because if it was left to our human nature, 
we don't have the desire or the ability to actually give forgiveness. There's a quote by Ellen White that I'll share with you. It says, how many are today manifesting the same spirit? When the debtor pleaded with his Lord for mercy, he had no true sense of the greatness of his debt. He did not realize his helplessness. He hoped to deliver himself. Have patience with me, he said, and I will pay thee all. So there are many who hope by their works to merit God's favor. They do not realize their helplessness. They do not accept the grace of God as a free gift, but are trying to build themselves in self-righteousness. Their own hearts are not broken and humbled on account of sin, and they are exacting and unforgiving towards each other. Their sins against God, compared with their brother's sins against them, are as 10,000 talents to 100 pence, nearly one million to one, yet they dare to be unforgiving. The human nature can only be brought under subjective subjection as we give it to God, and most of us, even as brothers and sisters, struggle, and we struggle to contend with our own human nature. If we truly understood the human nature, we would exercise more compassion. But what I realize about us is if someone else's struggle is our strength, it becomes difficult for us to empathize. It takes compassion and love to make a decision to love others when they hurt you. But God has the remedy. We are going to explore a story and go through the principles of forgiveness. So we're going to turn to Genesis 37. What does that have to do with us and what caused his brothers to be the, the way that they were? Now in Genesis 37 verses 1 to 4 it says, and Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought to his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children, because he was a son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Now Jacob had children, but he treated them differently. As we can see in these verses, we can tell that because he had loved Joseph more, he treated them different. He treated him differently than all of his other children. However, we can't just look at that one verse and draw a conclusion. We actually have to look at what took place before he had Joseph. Now, before he had Joseph, one of the things was that he was deceived into marrying Leah. Leah bare children, but he never really loved Leah. So when Rachel had children, when, she had, when he had children, he loved those children because he loved his wife. So when we look, we can see that the children had to grow up in a very contentious home. So we have all these, since there's polygamy going on, we have more than one wife in the home. And because it's more than one wife, everybody's competing for that one man's affection. And in competing for that one man's affection, now they can't speak peaceably to each other, they're jealous, and all of the children are actually looking on and seeing these things. So as they're looking on and seeing them, it's actually cultivating in them inherited tendencies and also to cultivated tendencies. So because they are in the home where they may not be as loved as the other child, or they're in the home and they're, the moms don't love each other, what's taking place is that these things are beginning to affect the children. So we see that here we have Joseph, he's 17, he's a lad, he is the most loved, and we can see that now everyone's looking on him and beginning to hate him simply because of the affection that he gets from his father. So a lot of times when things take place or if someone doesn't like us or if they're jealous or somebody treats us in a bad way, it doesn't necessarily mean that that has anything to do with you. 
a lot of times it comes from things that have taken place before you even came here. Now, Ellen White says about Jacob, which was Joseph's father. So we read that here, that Joseph treated Joseph differently. So all of the brothers who are in the house are looking on and saying, wow, like we noticed you got a coat of many colors, all these things you have in dreams, all these different things, and they begin to hate him. Ellen White says that the sin of Jacob and the train of events which led to it had not failed to exert an influence for evil. An influence that revealed its bitter fruit in the character and the life of his sons. So the father, his sins, are affecting his children. And that's one of the things about sin, is that it not only affects you, but it can also too affect generations to come. It says, the results of polygamy were manifest in the household. This terrible evil tends to dry up the very springs of love, and its influence weakened the most sacred ties. The jealousy of the several mothers had embittered the family relation. The children had grown up contentious and impatient of control, and the father's life was darkened with anxiety and grief. Now, since Joseph was loved by his father, he had the encouragement. He knew he was loved, so he had encouragement by his father. Um, he was a young, so he could develop into the young man that God would have him to be. And of all of the brothers, he was the most spiritual because he was receiving the most love and also, too, because his mother had died, he had clean more closely to his father. So he would sit with him, he would talk with him, but he was also, too, receiving that love so those things could be cultivated. Now, sometimes when things are the way they are, so we know that Joseph had no, he really had no part in his father being a polygamist. He, has n he had no part in necessarily being the one child that was loved by his father, but even though he didn't do anything per se. He also too had to experience some of the hardships that came from the unwise things that his father had done. Now sometimes when we experience anything, I know that all of us sitting in this room have probably experienced something from a brother or a sister that has not been pleasant. And we can take brothers and sisters out of there. Sometimes we've experienced things from our families that have not been pleasant. And a lot of times what takes place is that we think to ourselves, well, hey, well, what did I do wrong? I did nothing wrong. But a lot of times, something when people, we see that the brothers developed a disdain and dislike for their brother based upon what they were experiencing within their homes. A lot of times, things are the way they are, and we don't know why they are. That is unpleasant, and we get offended. But a lot of times, that's not, we don't have to take that burden onto ourselves. We can, and that's why God counsels us, because we don't understand people's experiences. We don't know what they've gone through that God counsels us when people do do things that are not as kind, that we should pray for them. We should still be kind to them because sometimes they're just acting out what they experienced growing up and they don't know how to be what you'd have them to be. So if you're, you come with an unforgiving spirit, how exactly are you teaching them to be better? And it's difficult. I never want to talk about it like it's not something that I never want to talk about it like it's something that's easy, but it's something that we can do because God has asked us to do it. In the dream, different dreams, and he now has different spiritual gifts. But because of the way he's being treated um, by his father and jealousy and envy is there, and because of the environment that's taking place, we know that he now has to experience these things that are going on. Now, it says also to in verse 6, And he said to them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. And he went on to explain the dream. And when he explained it, he told it to his father. And in verse 10 it says, And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to you in the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the same. And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Do not your brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send you to them. And he said to them, Here am I. And he said to him, Go, I pray you, see whether it be well with your brethren, and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. 
So he sent them out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seek you? And he said, I seek my brethren. I pray you where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They are departed from here. For I heard them say, Let us go down to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near to them, they conspired against him to slay, to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer comes. So we can see here in this story that as it continues to develop, that their hatred never got better. If anything, they became more angry with Joseph's presence. And one of the things that I notice with us when it comes to forgiveness sometimes is that even the very presence of someone being there can just completely disrupt your spirit. And that was what happened with them, is that they did not necessarily want him to be around simply because they had that hatred for him in their hearts. So even though their father was treating them better than they were treating him, we can say that they didn't necessarily have the tools to even respond the right way because of the way that they were treat the way that they had grown up. But one of the things that we learn here is that Joseph still continued to pursue him. He had no idea as to what was going on. And we can see that it continued to develop and develop and develop. One of the things that I realize when it comes to forgiveness is that a lot of times we don't necessarily express what we truly think or how we really feel. A lot of times when we are unforgiving, we keep that inside. If you look in this story, you can see that they struggled for a really long time with whatever they were seeing or which whatever they were experiencing but they never talked to anyone about it. They never said, they never went to their father and said, hey, you treat Joseph differently, never. And a lot of times when that unforgiving spirit festers, sometimes you can talk to the person that you're having the issue with and it be resolved there. God gives us a remedy for that. He says in his word that we should have the one-on-one -on -one conversation. And if the one-on-one -on -one doesn't work, he says, come with someone else. And if that doesn't work, then bring them before the brethren. And if that doesn't work, then let him be an infidel. But a lot of times, our unforgiving spirit comes because we just have not had the conversation. And we can see that here they are. They hated him, but they kept that to themselves. And in keeping it to themselves, they weren't praying about it. They didn't talk about it. And it continued to manifest. So we see that when it comes to forgiveness, a lot of times, a lot of issues can be resolved if we talk. I'm not saying every issue, because sometimes you go to some people and you have a conversation, and it doesn't necessarily go the way that you had intended, but it's important to get it out. And if that doesn't work, you always have that spirit of forgiveness and you have that conversation with God. Now, as we continue to go through the story, we see that they have no desire for Joseph whatsoever, and these are his brothers, which brings me to the next point. A lot of times, we think that the issues are gonna come from without, but they come from within. And God allows them to come from within to test and to teach us what he would have them to learn. I don't think when he went out that day that he thought that he was going to be sold into slavery. That was beyond his mind. But God allowed it, and he allowed it for a purpose. A lot of times when things take place in the church, we're ready, we're, we think, oh well, that sister shouldn't be like that because she's in the church. I'm at his, and then when things take place within us, we're like, well, I'm gonna go out into the world because they act better than that. God has not told us that when we come into the church that we're not going to have issues. He has given us the remedy for the issues. When you, something does take place, it needs to be addressed a particular way. So when it comes to forgiveness, when it comes to addressing and dealing with certain concerns, do not always think that it's gonna come from the outside. It's gonna come from within. It can, be, it can be between husband and wife. It can be between brother and sister. It can be between friend and friend. In the church, out the church, it's gonna take place here. 
I'm a social worker now. And one of the things that they tell us is that abuse happens nine times out of 10 inside the home. So never think that because we're in the church that things won't take place. Don't, don't prepare your mind to think, hey, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm in the church and be naive and all these people are perfect. We're never gonna have any issues. You're gonna be deceived. And not only are you gonna be deceived, but you're gonna have a hard time getting through that. So we have to know that, yeah, we're not looking at brother or sister so-and-so and thinking they're going to deceive or they're gonna do particular things to us. But be mindful that in the church, we are still growing. And as we are still growing, we're not making excuses for it, but we also too need to understand that this is where these things take place. And we still have to have that forgiving spirit with one another. Now, as it continued, we see as you go further down in the chapter, we see that they eventually sold Joseph. Now, can you imagine? You went to see if your brothers were okay, and then you get sold? What exactly do you do? All you did was went to see if they were, they were okay, and then they say, you know what? I hate you, and I'm going to sell you. And they sold him. It wasn't a dream. It wasn't a figment of his imagination. He laid there in the pit. And if we go to, if we go here to 23, as it, it says that, and it came to pass when Joseph was come to his brethren, that they stripped Joseph out of his coat. So he, they took his coat off, that coat that dad bought you. We couldn't take it off in front of him. I'm going to take it off right now, right? His coat of many colors that was on him, they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. And they sat down. After they threw him into the pit, they sat down to eat bread. So here they are, they throw him into the pit. We're still gonna eat. He's hungry, we don't care. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked. And behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead, and their camels bearing spices and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brother, what profit is it if we slay our brother? and conceal his blood. So they wanted to kill him, but they said, hey, why don't we get paid? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, and we, and our flesh, and his brethren were content. So they decided to sell him, and when they sold him, they sold him, and pretty much forgot about him. It says in verse 28, it says, There came to pass by the Midianites merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit, and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. And Reuben returned to the pit, because he didn't, of all the brothers, he didn't necessarily want to do that. And behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he rent his clothes. And he returned to his brethren and said, The child is not, and I, where shall I go? And they took Joseph's coat and killed the kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, this have we found, now know whether it be your son's coat or no. And we can see that their father mourned for many days, but can you imagine Joseph, how he felt? He was going through all these things. He pretty much went out one day, and when he went out one day, he never returned home. He never saw his beloved father. He never had the coat that he had. And it says here, Ellen White actually shares his experience. It says, meanwhile, Joseph with his captors was on the way to Egypt, and the caravan journeyed southward toward the borders of Canaan. The boy could discern in the distant the hills which lay his father's tents. Bitterly he wept at the thought of that the loving father, bitterly he wept at thought of that loving father in his loneliness and affliction. Again, the scene of Dothan came before him. He saw his angry brothers and felt their fierce glances belt, bent upon him. The stinging, insulting words that had met his agonizing entreaties were ringing in his ears. With a trembling heart, he looked forward to the future. What a change in situation from the tenderly cherished son to the despised and helpless slave, alone and friendless. What would be his lot in the strange land to which he was going? For a time, Joseph gave himself up to uncontrolled grief and terror. So here he was being sold, 
he could see when he was before he was sold that he could hear the words that they were saying that were mean or he could see them saying all these different things but he had to come to a place in his experience he was like terrified like i was once loved by my father now i'm going to a place that i don't know so he had to come to a place in his experience where he had to say god this is the lot that i've been given a lot of times um some of us have memories of things that have taken place maybe that mean thing that was said to you as a child or maybe that mean thing that person did in school one day. Sometimes we have those experiences, and for a while we grieve and we weep over them. Sometimes you, you look back and you're like, wow, God, like that was really hurtful. I never forgot that, and this affects me up until this day right now. So we have all, in some shape or form, had Joseph's experience. But it says here that he had to come to a place where he had to now lean wholly on God. A lot of times when we are going through different experiences, we have to remember that it's really not about us. It's about what God truly desires to develop in us. So sometimes we go through things and we think to ourselves, you know, God, I don't see why I have to do this. I don't see why I have to go through this. But God, even with Joseph, had to teach him to wholly rely on him. And even as we look at Jesus, we can see that with Jesus, his experience he didn't deserve anything that he got in this world but nonetheless he had to come to save us so a lot of times we don't know why things take place and it's hurtful I would never tell you that it's not difficult and I would never tell you it's not hurtful but what I want to encourage us as brothers and sisters to do is to hold on to God during those moments don't allow those things to define who you are don't allow them to make you give up on God I know some a lot of people who have said I'm leaving the church because of what this sister or this brother has done, you never, ever give anybody that power over your life for you to, to now come to a place in your experience where you have decided that you no longer want to walk with God. Absolutely not. You go down on your knees and you pray and you allow God to walk you through that experience. Because as we are being walked through those experiences, we are becoming more like Christ. We are actually having Christ's experience going through those times that he was in Gethsemane and going through those times that it's been difficult. So pray, ask God to help you get through those things. Ask God to help you to forgive. Never allow someone to have so much power over you that you're willing to disconnect your God, yourself from God. Allow him to get you through those experiences. Now in Genesis 50, verse 16 to 20, we're gonna turn there. It says in 16 to verse 20. So we see that Joseph had to experience a lot of things. He went to Potiphar's house, the wife lied on him, bam, another thing. So he's going through a lot of devastating experiences. He gets to jail, things happen in jail. So we have all these experiences that are taking place and I don't know about anyone that's here, but sometimes you feel like it just continues to rain. But then it's, no, first it starts by drizzling, right? So it starts to drizzle. And then the rain starts to come down harder until you feel like it's a bunch of hurricanes coming. A lot of times we could, when we look at Joseph's experience, we can say that that was his experience. Like for a little while, it seems like Joseph could not get a break because he's going through all these devastating events. He's being sold by his brother. Then after he's sold by his brother, he's going through having to be lied on, be cast into a prison for something he never committed, but God had a work for him to do. So a lot of times when God is allowing certain things, because nothing can take place if God has not allowed it. If God allows these things to take place, there's something about it that he wants to teach you. So in your forgiving experience, as you're going through things, remind yourself, God, I'm your child. This would not take place if you have not allowed it. It's very difficult, but help me to get through it. Now we see that if we go to Genesis 50, and I'm coming to a close, we see that Joseph had to go through something. So Joseph, we see that he had to get to a place where he was actually the person in control. And he was the one who was able, who was, he was the one who his brothers were actually at his mercy. And that's one of the things that I noticed about God 
is that when you allow yourself to be shaped and to be molded into who he would have you to be, a lot of times he'll put you in a position that you yourselves could not ever see. So he placed Joseph in a position where he was now in power. He was actually doing what um, Pharaoh had called him to be, but he would not be there if he had not gone through certain experiences. So he almost had to go and be sold by his brothers because there was something that needed to take place that he needed to do. Now, we see that it comes a time where there's a famine. And because there's a famine in the land, the brothers have to actually come and speak to Joseph, and they don't recognize him. Joseph recognizes them, and he goes through his experience with them to see where they are. Are these people still who they were when they sold me? He asks them, where's my brother? And he could see by the way that they are interacting with each other that they have come to a place in their experience that they now are repentant. These are not the same men that were the ones who sold me, and he accepted that. Which brings me to my next point, is that a lot of times um, with our brothers and sisters, I know that we have this tendency, when we're in our unforgiveness, we have a tendency to speak really ill of each other. So if something takes place, we have the tendency to go and talk to our brother and say, hey, you know, did you know sister so-and-so did this or brother so-and-so did this? And we do that because we're harboring that unforgiving spirit. But what I want to encourage us today to do um, as we are going through our forgiving experience, I don't know if you guys are, I don't know your lives, I don't know your story, but I know that we have all had to go through something that's difficult. I just want to encourage you as you're going through that, allow the Lord to really use you and to really do what he said that he would do. So we see that with Joseph, that he had to come to a place where he had to see if they had changed and I also had to accept that. A lot of times we like to hold people in the past um, and that comes through unforgiveness. Um, we wanna hold them there, that person who yelled or screamed or spoke ill about me, no, that's who you are to me. And because that's who you are, you deserve to be treated like this. Um, but there are times that God is also too working on that person's heart. And I think that's why it's so important as we go through our, our own forgiving and our learning about forgiveness that we also too have to allow the Lord to use us because to work on us so that we also too, when that moment comes, when they are not the same way, we can accept that. So we see that with Joseph, that he had tested them. He tested them a bit to see where they were. And then when he found out that these brothers are not the same, he had to accept that. Now I just kind of want to end with um, Genesis chapter 50. It says that when they had gone through everything, um, he had to get to a place where he says, in verse 16, and they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father did command before he died saying, so shall you say to Joseph, forgive, forgive, I pray you now, the trespasses of your brethren and their sins, for we did to you evil. And now we pray, forgive the trespasses of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. And his brethren also my and God's day to save many people alive. Now therefore, fear you not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And, be, and he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house, and Joseph lived 110 years. So we see that it was an experience for Joseph, and it's an experience for us when it, when it comes to forgiveness and unforgiveness, that it's an experience that we have to do with the Lord. A lot of times we ask ourselves, why, why me? But don't ask yourself, why me? Say to God, God, help me get through this. God, not why me? but help me to overcome and get through this and come out better than I was before. And as you, as you go through your experience, God will be there with you. These issues or the things that we go through are not meant to break us. They're meant to solidify our characters for eternity. So whatever you're going through, I don't know. You know, each of us have different homes. Each of us, each of us have experienced different things. But I'm just praying 
that as we've looked through his story, that we allow it to be our story and to know that God will bring us to a better place and that we don't have to continue to, even though we do go through the things that we do, we don't have to hold on to them, that we can truly allow the Lord to use us. So I hope that um, whoever's here who has those things, I'm going to pray a prayer before I close and we will close, okay? So let us bow our heads for prayer. Dear kind and compassionate Father, we want to give you thanks and praise for allowing us to be able to see real people in the Bible. Lord, we realize that sometimes we are going through and experiencing different things, but it's not something that the people in your word have an experience. And you're so honest with us that you show us that, hey, this is something that took place years ago. Lord, I know no one here. You know everybody's circumstance. You know everything that these people are going through. But one thing we do know is that you are a faithful God. And we know that because you are faithful, you will allow us to go through things and also to walk with us. We see in Joseph's experience that you never left him. You are always with him. And Lord, as we go through our experiences, help us to hold on to the fact that you allow these things and you will get us through these things. God, continue to cultivate that spirit of forgiveness. We don't always understand, but we know that you do. So please be with us. Help us. Strengthen us. Help us to hold on to your word in those moments that seem distressing. Help us to truly love and to become more like you. In Jesus' precious name we do pray. Amen. Sasha for the message this morning. Now we're about to do our closing hymn, number 633. And Anna, come on.
hands for benediction. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, though the blood of the everlasting covenant, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.